attacking the people of the city of Corinth because the rich were taking too long with their meal. They probably had a five-course dinner while the poor had a brown bag lunch. And so the poor were finished eating their little sandwich while the rich were getting drunk. And so St. Paul says, you can't do this. This is not charitable. You got to hurry. You got to eat together. That original language, probably, when it was celebrated in Jerusalem, was in Aramaic. But that language, that Aramaic language, which was Jesus' language, which was a dialect of Hebrew, much like Creole or Cajun French is a, dial, a, a dialect of Parisian French. And as the church expanded along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, the language of the people was not Aramaic. The language of the people was Greek. And so the, the language of the liturgy then adopted the, the Greek language because that was the common tongue. And so we knew that the language was changing. And somewhere as the Roman Empire, it was Constantine in 313, that liberated Christianity from persecution and aligned Christianity with the imperial court of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, the imperial court spoke Latin, and so the, the liturgy assumed the Latin language, which again was a common language of the people. The church, however, just didn't change as new tongues developed and it just kept the Latin language for the Roman Catholic Church. The Greek Orthodox, of course, continued to do their language, use their language, Greek, Syriac, um, even some had Aramaic, used, uh, used Aramaic, and still use Aramaic for the words of institution. Now we know that our structure of the Mass, our structure of the Mass, finds its roots at least by the year 150. No doubt, during St. Paul's time, that structure of the Mass, bread, meal, which was called the agape meal, and then the taking of the cup of wine. That was the original order of the Eucharist. In 70 AD in Jerusalem, the temple gets destroyed. Christianity no longer has to align itself with Judaism. You know, and St. Paul and St. Peter had a big fight about that. St. Peter wanted to make the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people who were interested in Christianity, become Jews first. And St. Paul says, no, 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 you don't have to do that. And there was a big old council and, and the Holy Spirit sided with with St. Paul. St. Paul was in the right direction. So there was a break with the Jewish identity, not probably before 70 AD, but somewhere between 70 AD and 150. And we know by 150 because there's a document that was written by St. Justin of Rome. He was a, a deacon, a philosopher. It's called the First Apology wherein he gives the order of the Mass as we do it today. As we do it today. And he, he adds something that all pastors love. He even says, you have to have a collection. So that is sacrosanct, don't, so don't complain. Now when Charlemagne comes around in the 8th and 9th centuries, there was a greater desire for a universal ritual to be used in the Roman West, in the Roman Catholic Church, because the various countries 
had their own missiles. In Gaul there was one, in France there was one, in England there was one, in Germany there was one, in uh, Spain there was one, and basically the structure was the same, but they had variations. And it was during the reign of Charlemagne that the church began the discussion of let's try to make this more universal for the Roman church. The great schism happened in the 11th century between the East and the West. The, the, the East was never part of this, this movement to try to, um, to suppress local rituals. Um, the, the relationship between the East and the West uh, really had great difficulties even before the breakup in 1054. The first mass book to bear the title Roman Missal came in the year 1474. It was similar to the Missal of Pope Innocent III from the 13th century. Innocent III's papacy included St. Francis of Assisi, great, great saints. The 13th century produced many, many great saints. The Missal, however, that was in 1474 was very much like the Missal of Pope Innocent from the 13th century. But the first universal Missal of the Roman Catholic Church, the first universal, mandated universal Missal for the Roman Catholic Church came from the Council of Trent in 1570. And it was the Missal of Pius V. The Council of Trent, of course, you may remember a little bit, came as a result of Martin Luther's objections. And so it was the opportunity of the church to make sure that what we were praying was orthodox. And so it became mandated with the Missal of Pius V in 1570. That's the first universal Missal for the Roman Church. So for 1,500 years, the Church had been celebrating the liturgy without an official, universal, everybody doing the same thing book. That Missal lasted from 1750 to the provisional text of 1965. Used for 400 years with only very, very slight revisions. Which is why people thought it would never change. Although the first 1,500 years, there was always shifting and always changing. But those 400 years of using that one missile somehow ingrained in our psyche that this would never change. But the Second Vatican Council and the Holy Spirit had different plans. And so, the provisional text into the vernacular was compiled in 1965, Latin and English both, which we also called it the Dialogue Mass. In 1969, Pope Paul VI issued, promulgated his Missal. So it replaced Pius V's Missal from 1470, 1570. Paul VI issued his, promulgated his new missal in 1969. The initial translation in 1970, uh, and I remember it so well because Father Gary Schechtsneider was our associate pastor at St. Peter's then. And when this 1970 missal in the English came out, I was in the parish office, I was answering the phone with Ms. B, 
Y'all must be still there. God bless her. <laughs> um, and Father Shechsnader came in with the missalette, running up and down the, uh, the hall. You know how energetic he is. He goes, oh, I love this, I love this. And he's talking about the confidior because they had introduced for what I have done and what I have failed to do. And he was so excited about what I have failed to do. He goes, now we're going to get him. So... So from 1970 to 1975, we were working, we had a, an English text, but in 1975, that English text gets official recognition, what we call the recognitio from the Holy See. That 1975 text, translation of the 1969 Missal of Pope Paul VI, then goes through another revision in 1983. Add some saints, because there were some saints that were canonized, included that in the 1983 Missal. We sent this reworked translation to Rome. I was ordained in 83, and I remember the new Missal, the new translation. We sent that to Rome, because you have to do that when you make some alterations in the translation or including some stuff. Rome never sent back the recognitio for the 1983, which is probably when the Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, said, you know what, maybe it's time to revisit the whole principle of translation. I mean, it could be as far back as then. He became Pope in 1979, so for, for those four years, he probably was beginning to think in, those, in, the, in that direction. The, the new translation, uh, the 1983 uh, third edition of the Roman Missal of Pope Paul VI was sent to Rome in 1998, and never, it never came back. It never came back with the permission. 2000, blessed John Paul II now, Pope John Paul II, issued his missal. So we're, we, we have three official missals in the history of the church. The one from 1570, the one from 1969, and then now the 2001. And again, the Pope wanted to issue a new missal because he wanted to include all the new saints that had been canonized from 1969. Thank you for tuning into this special on the New Roman Missal. Please join us next week on this station as we continue this three-part series. If you would like to view this program again, you may find it on our website on www.dio.laf.org. Go to the Office tab and scroll down to Radio and TV Ministry and click on Tell the People. We hope you've enjoyed our program because it is produced for you.